welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and today my guest is Arvind Panagarya, who is a professor of economics and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. He is also a former vice chairman of the Niti Aayog. His recent book, Free Trade and Prosperity, How Openness Helps Developing Countries Grow Richer and Combat Poverty provides the most comprehensive theoretical overview and empirical evidence between free trade and economic growth in developing countries. I had a chance to speak with Arvind about how India transitioned from a closed economy in the 50s to market liberalization in the last 3 decades. We also discussed the Indian growth story, a single domestic market within India, the difficulties in the Indian reform process, Arvind's intellectual influences and much more. For a full transcript of this conversation, including helpful links of all the references mentioned, click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com. Hi Arvind, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure Shruti, great to be with you. more than half of indians living today were born after liberalization and they never experienced the closed economy and the process of liberalization and a bulk of our podcast listeners probably fall in that age group can you give us some context about how india was close to global trade starting in the 1950s and then the liberalization that followed in later decades and and can you just walk us through some of that context since you've lived through it and written about it Sure, Shruti. So, post-independence, there was general consensus among policymakers and scholars, economists included, that as far as the developed countries were concerned, they needed more open markets. And alongside the discussions for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank under the auspices of the Bretton Woods Conference, there was a parallel process which was actually separately under the auspices of the United Nations. to start a new institution called the International Trade Organization or the ITO to liberalize trade largely among the developed countries and it took another almost 50 years till 1995 when the World Trade Organization came to life but in between as a part of the discussions of the ITO the general agreement on tariffs and trade was signed off which sort of more or less ended up substituting for the ITO and under the auspices of the general agreement on tariffs and trade the united states brought european economic community as it the european union was known then japan canada and other developed countries but really these four quad countries as they used to be called they launched the liberalization process now in parallel developing countries of participants some of them including india were members actually of the original signatories of the gatt but the view taken at the time again by both policy makers scholars everybody was that as far as the developing countries were concerned they were just starting their development process and they really needed some protection the intellectual underpinnings of that thinking was as follows that you know generally economists thought in those days in terms of a two sector economy one was agriculture and the other was industry and it was thought uh, or agriculture sometimes more broadly described as primary products and so even if you know there were three then still it was primary secondary and tertiary which would be services but the point was that well these developing countries as far as exports are concerned have a comparative advantage in primary products that's what they would be exporting but the problem as identified was that you know primary products really cannot serve as the engine of growth and this was rooted in turn in this elasticity pessimism that both income elasticity of demand and price elasticity of demand for primary products were low low income elasticity meant that as the incomes rise in the industrial countries the demand will continuously shift away from primary products low income elasticity towards manufacturers and therefore the relative prices will move in favor of industrial products and against the primary products 
if the developing countries themselves actually increase productivity in primary products, if they uh, increase investment in primary products and try to expand the exports of primary products, because of low price elasticity, the prices will drop dramatically. And so the revenues in turn that they would get for yet larger volume of exports would actually be lower than what they were getting for a smaller quantity of exports previously. So it was a self-defeating thing. And then of course, you know, as economists, we always try to concoct some clever arguments for why industry ought to be protected. And so, you know, infant industry argument, of course, came to the fore that, oh, you know, look, you are just starting in industrialization. And uh, if you really expose yourself to freer trade, then, you know, your industry will be swamped by these well-established foreign industries and so forth. So that was the kind of intellectual underpinning of the processes. In the Indian case, there was an additional and perhaps a more powerful factor at work that after independence, Prime Minister Nehru very much felt that, look, you know, we need to be self-sufficient. And for him, self-sufficiency really meant that we ought not to have to depend for our exports on the world markets and for our consumption also on the imports from the world markets. We ought to produce what we consume. So his thinking was more driven by this whole nationalism and that we have just got political freedom and if we remain economically dependent, then this is going to be a problem. So that's where it started. And this was also then, of course, this kind of thinking also set very well with Nehru's socialism, where he wanted the state to expand. His socialism was a little bit more enlightened, I would say, than subsequently of Mrs. Gandhi, his daughter's was. He felt that we ought to really expand the public sector through incremental investments over the years. That, you know, we increase the share of the state in the investment and over time more and more production activity will take place in the public sector and that would expand the public sector. Later on, Mrs. Gandhi, when she succeeded in 1967, after Nehru had died and her socialism went much farther she tried to expand the public sector through nationalization of industries. So Nehru in this sense was a little bit more, more enlightened. Nevertheless, what did it mean? When you say that, look, you know, we got to produce what we consume, that means that if you are going to need bicycles, you then produce, not just assemble the bicycles, that you also produce the various parts of the bicycle, then, of course, if you are going to produce these different parts of the bicycles, you also need the machines that produce those parts. So you need to produce machines. Then you need to also produce the steel because steel goes into the machines and the different parts of the bicycle. And that, of course, meant trying to produce everything. And so this whole diversification of the industry had to be so incredible for which you really didn't have the capital. So how do you really, you know, make it all add up? Well, the way they tried to add it up was that all the capital intensive industry is only the part where we will allow larger units. And there also we will limit the number of units so that we can get the diversification. And so the, on the one hand, many sectors were reserved for the public sector. And in many others where private sector was allowed, they also decided that through investment licensing, we will control and so anything that was, you know, larger than even, say, a million dollars worth of investment in those days, in, in the initial 50s and 60s, became subject to either monopoly of the state or licensing by the state. So you had to get a license. And of course, everybody knew, even in the 50s, that if you were seeking a license for a large scale unit in apparel or in footwear, furniture, those sorts of industries, you'll never get it. So they knew, so nobody would apply, in fact, you know, but the government will point out that, look, you know, chemical industries are our private, private industry, steel industries are private industry. So they knew that licenses will be issued for those industries. And so basically you reserved most of the available capital, which was very meager in those days anyway, because savings rate was not even 10%. And so you try to reserve that for these capital intensive industries and labor intensive industries therefore became cottage industries. All the employment got put into these cottage industries. 
So on the one hand, you know, you, you put up some industrial units in products such as steel, tires, those sorts of things. Even two automobile companies we had and then later on scooters and so forth. But as far as the labor intensive industry in which India had a comparative advantage as exporters and that's what the Koreans and Taiwanese, Singaporeans, they all exploited actually in the 60s, 70s and the 80s to become these, you know, real export powerhouses were neglected in India. We simply neglected. And now the quality of the product in these obviously deteriorated because you stopped the imports, you won't allow the imports, there was not enough foreign exchange, so you will not allow imports. And you domestically also limited yourselves to these cottage industries. So the quality was abysmal. I quote in the book, you know, this one example where Jagdish Bhagwati, you know, in the very early 60s returned from Cambridge to India. And at that time, you know, he was also like everybody else, very nationalistic. And so he wrote to his mentor, Harry Johnson, saying that, dear Harry, I am really amazed how much craze of the foreign goods exists in the country. And I just don't understand why. And so Harry Johnson wrote him back saying that, well, dear Jagdish, if the quality of the paper on which your letter is written is any indication of the quality of Indian products, <laughs> then seems to me that <laughs> the craze for foreign goods among the Indians is quite rational. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, you couldn't export. I mean, the point also, the substantive point is that it's such poor quality, you couldn't export. And if you couldn't export, then you couldn't import. So this became a vicious circle. And so we all suffered. And because of this licensing business, also you produce very little of the quantities. So automobiles were limited in quantity, scooters were limited in quantity. And so therefore, you couldn't just walk in and, and buy in a showroom these products, right? So for many products, cement was another one. We also created this, you know, this is how the bureaucratic mind works, right? So the supply is limited. Well, if limited supply, the price will be very high. That, of course, means very high profits for those who got the license. But then we are a socialist country. How can we allow profits to be made like that for an assured market? And so the government will say, no, 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 we are going to control the price. Well, you control the price. That means there is excess demand below market price. There is excess demand. You are going to allocate the quantity. A great example of what you just described is Bajaj scooters. You know, they went through this entire process. And I learned from my parents who got married in the 70s that apparently in those days, the number one dowry demand was a Bajaj scooter. <laughs> right? But you had a wait list of multiple years to get a first-hand Bajaj scooter. So actually, the price of a second-hand Bajaj scooter in the open market was higher than the price of a brand new first first-hand Bajaj scooter because then you could get the second-hand one immediately whereas you'd have to wait for the first-hand for another four years and the daughter has to get married immediately. <laughs> so <laughs> there were these incredible, you know, unintended consequences out of these artificial scarcities that were generated Absolutely. during these times. And like you described, every intervention leads to a more bizarre intervention immediately after because that's how bureaucratic minds think. That's how the economics of control works. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, I remember actually, you know, because the price is below market, the fixed price, official one. So you start thinking of what criteria do I use to now allocate the limited quantity that I got, right? Yes. One of the quotas for allocation was foreign exchange quota for scooters. Absolutely. Again, you know, the Lambertine and Bajaj scooters both. There was a foreign exchange quota. So after I came to the U.S., there would be demands from my relatives that, you know, please, can you bring me $800? <laughs> you know, and $800 when converted to, to, to rupees, you know, it got the price of the scooter. So then they could get it immediately. And there was, a, you know, there was a premium, as you said, get the foreign exchange, buy the scooter at official price. There is market so you can immediately sell it in black. <laughs> exactly. No, so these, I mean, these times are incredible. I lived through it for a short period. I didn't think of it analytically. I was too young. But even for me, through liberalization, the change in the quality of chocolates, you know, how many more consumer goods one could buy, it was very quick and very stark. In the early 90s, we saw the changes quite quickly. Even to kids, it was apparent that something is different. When you go to the store, 
Yeah, because now, you know, you got Amul and Cadbury chocolate and now you have Kit Kat and four other kinds of chocolate, right? And for me as a child, that's my first interaction with liberalization in one sense, right? You can drink Coca-Cola and things like that. And, you know, I mean, if Michael Jackson has Pepsi in his hand, then now I can also drink Pepsi, right? So that's sort of the, <laughs> for me, that's the miracle of liberalization, where previously I remember a time when I couldn't. That's very interesting perspective. When did India liberalize and how did it happen? We usually pick 1991 as the big date. But as you've described in multiple books, there have been moments when, you know, there have been delicensing, there have been some openness to trade in bits and pieces, not wholesome. So can you just walk us through that from maybe, say, the late 70s? Yeah, good. So by late 70s, the growth rate really had plummeted and all. At least the first 13, 14 years, you were getting a growth rate of on average about 4.5% or so. But in the decade, I say this that, you know, in the decade I came into the US, I left in 1974, September. And if I take the 10-year period preceding it, growth rate was hardly, particularly when you look at per capita income growth rate, it was so low that you didn't see. In, so in the 10 years, I saw no kind of improvement in the living standards. By late 70s, it even to some at least enlightened bureaucrats, it began to look like, you know, things had gone too far. And there is an interesting book by an Indian bureaucrat from somewhere in mid-1980s. I can't off the top of my head remember his name. But he sort of wrote that, look, you know, nobody wanted to admit that this was, whole thing was a mistake. And so nobody, particularly in the political class, and therefore there was no real policy shift. But within the existing policy framework, could we make some changes? And so those changes began to be kind of made. Now, it got helped by one important development, which was the oil crisis. There were a lot of Indians who went to work in the Middle East and they started sending some modest remittances. So that began to ease up a little bit the foreign exchange situation. And as you know, we had foreign exchange control. So all exchange, of course, had to flow through the Reserve Bank of India and all. So, so that was one factor which made it a little bit possible that, you know, we got a little bit more cushion in terms of the availability of the foreign exchange. In addition, pressures also started coming from the industry. You know, whatever little bit of industry got set up at the time, the industrialists began to push that, look, you know, we got the capacity to produce, but we don't have the inputs that we need to produce. So please, you know, allow the inputs to come in. So some reform happened beginning in the late 1970s that, look, you know, let us begin to allow at least some of the critical inputs that we don't produce domestically at all. And there was this idea of open general licensing that was introduced that anything that you got, that you put on the open general licensing list will not require an import license. Although you still required the permission for foreign exchange. So exchange control still, you know, so you still had to go to the certification that uh, foreign exchange is made available. But it became a little more liberal. And what they did was in the 1980s was to expand this list gradually. And, and by the late 1980s, the list had been expanded quite a bit. In the second half of the 1980s, now, you know, when Rajiv Gandhi became prime minister, actually, some of the little bit of delicensing on investment, not delicensing, but easing up of investment licensing also had begun to happen. And there was something that IDEA introduced called broadbending. That if you were given license to produce, let's say, spoons, and you also wanted to use some of that capacity to produce some knives or forks, then you could do that, right? You know, I mean, you can see how <laughs> tight this licensing was. They will specify exact. You couldn't even produce related products without permission. So this broadbending, you know, so if you tell the Americans here about broadbending, they said, you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, I mean, shouldn't they be producing all three <laughs> in the first place? When Rajiv Gandhi came, uh, became prime minister, he was clearly very liberal minded. And some of the noises he made were absolutely fantastic. Although, you know, his, his big steps really were taken in the first two years. And then he really got captured by the protectionist lobbies again. 
but but some of that happened and you know he was big on the information technology industry so some you know imports of the computers etc were also eased up a little bit but what also happened that the reserve bank got a very enlightened governor this was mr malhotra what he did was that he recognized that there had been gross overvaluation of the rupee which was hurting india's performance on exports and so you know he kept this kind of fiction that oh we are pegged to a basket of exchange rates you know the political problem was such that you couldn't openly say that we are going to let rupee float so so he said well you know it's pegged to a basket of ex- of currencies and you know then the exchange rate can move depending on how the basket moves but actually if you look back there is no way you know the basket of currencies was not moving enough to cause the kind of depreciation that happened in in the second half of the 1980s and that helped a big time so if you look at the last 3 years actually of uh, 1980s 88 89 89 90 and maybe 90 91 yeah those 3 years particularly 88 89 growth rate was almost 10% or something some bizarrely high growth rate which we never had seen average was over 7% for those last 3 years and that was helped quite a bit and then they also introduced some east asian style you know export incentives while imports were not so much well some liberalization imports was happening through the continuous expansion of the open general licensing list but then they also started giving export incentives that you know if you exported you will be given foreign exchange part of which you could keep and use for other imports and that of course because there was a huge huge premium still even though some depreciation of the rupee happened there still remained a very large premium because rupee still rem- the overvaluation was so much that even after depreciation it remained overvalued and so those were the things so you got some bit of liberalization and you also got some return on it so if you look at 1980s growth rate did shift a bit and particularly the last 3 years that i mentioned you know 7% so when you combine those years then you easily get more than 5% something between 5 and 6% over the 80s so so that was the early kind of liberalization and then in 91 we of course had the big dismantling of a number of tariffs and also industrial licensing in a big way 1991 was of course a complete change of the framework yes and i think here the political economy is very important one thing i have already pointed out that you know internally this realization was progressively happening that this uh, a system that we have adopted of these strict controls is not working so that was helping and there were some enlightened bureaucrats who very much were wanting liberalization to happen but two other events actually external events were very important in changing the thinking particularly at the political level one was that the soviet union after which we had chosen all the planning system under nehru and then that continued under indira gandhi and all you know and all the way to till very recently right and until prime minister modi actually decided to replace planning commission by the niti aayog so once soviet union collapsed i think that was a big jolt to to the planners that you know something uh, was not right about about the planning system the second thing that happened was that look you know there were only a handful of like jagdish bhagwati tn shrinivasan uh, very very few people who would make the case for liberalization in an unreserved sort of way but they never got any traction you know because you cite the example of singapore or hong kong they say oh they are the single cities you know they are irrelevant what does it matter even if you cite them south korea which was a somewhat a larger country and taiwan which was not as large as korea but still larger than the city states we still would be that oh they are too small to be relevant for us but then china in the late 1980s liberalized Uh, sorry late 1970s they liberalized the dropping and all you know 1980s china grew 10% a year that of course you know china was in population bigger than india so you know if you uh, if there is a country which is bigger than you and at that a communist country so when that happens you can't sustain the argument that these other countries are too small to be relevant for us i mean china was clearly relevant to india You know I'm surprised by this because if you look at South Korea's trajectory you know post World War 2 I think South Korea was the second poorest country or something like that they had no real natural resources no minerals right it was a country entirely propped up by american aid in one sense right and the transformation of south korea from basically one of the poorest places in the world with no opportunity to 
a properly developed country. You know, even during COVID, we see how South Korea has handled it better than the United States, right? Better than United Kingdom. The kind of trajectory South Korea had over, say, 30 or 40 years is better than what some countries like the UK and US had over 200 years. So why do you think that experience is marginalized so much in the trade and development literature? To me, South Korea is probably the greatest success story we've ever had. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you. And and so I sometimes lament that, you know, even South Koreans are not very comfortable talking about Park Chung-hee, who was really the the maker of modern South Korea, because he's authoritarian and so forth. So, you know, subsequently, he doesn't occupy the same place in South Korea that Lee Kuan Yew does in Singapore. But, you know, if one thinks about it, really, in, in some way, South Korea's achievement was even bigger for the reasons you mentioned that, you know, it was completely devastated in 19, the civil war between North and South Korea. If you come to 1954, they'd lost a million people in that civil war, you know, and devastation economically was just complete. And to rise up from that, it is absolutely phenomenal. Now, you know, that was not all Park Chung-hee because Park Chung-hee comes in 1963. But if no Park Chung-hee, of course, no South Korea story, no question. So in the South Korean story, how much of it is free trade and prosperity and how much of it is industrial policy? Because this is one constant source of discussion, right, between trade economists and development economists of how much is trade part or like, you know, outward embracing of global markets part of the success story of South Korea? Yeah, you know, Shruti, in this, I must say that the proponents of this industrial policy school have so obscured the reality of South Korea. And I must say that a lot of the people on the side of free trade advocacy have not done a great job actually of defending. Often they give in, they yeah, yeah, you know. This is what I separate out that when does Korea start? About 1963 is the turning point. This starts with liberalizing the economy. In 1963 to 1973, there is no industrial targeting. I mean, even when I started looking at all the evidence, I came in thinking that Korea was doing some industrial targeting all through. Then from 63 to 73, I see no industrial targeting. No, so I was a bit puzzled at that time. So this is while writing this book, actually, I wanted to be 100% sure. So I had worked in the summers during my graduate work at the World Bank with Larry Westfall. Now, not many people know who Larry Westfall is today. But Larry Westfall was the first American actually to study South Korea very, very closely. And he was no pre-trader. He was, in fact, a firmly believed in infant industry targeting or protection. But he was much more nuanced and also very honest scholar. So I wrote to him because he had written in, in the Journal of Economic Perspective, he had written in 1993 or somewhere there, early 1990s, the Korea story. I knew Larry because I'd worked in the summer with him. So I wrote to him. He had then moved to Swarthmore College. And I said, you know, I don't see anything going on. And so he said, you're absolutely right. That only some of the petrochemicals and fertilizer complex that they tried to promote because of the obvious reasons that every country does, you know, fertilizer for agriculture and, and petroleum for energy security. But other than that, he said, the incentives regime was completely neutral across products. And that shows up in some of the products that they exported, right? Because you start, you know, early 1960s, you look in the data, there is one product which is hardly present. It's not, it's absent actually, it's zero. And by late 70s or early 70s, 10% of the exports are coming from this one single product. Nobody would ever guess what it was. It was the human hair. (laughs) The Koreans were exporting in very large volumes wigs to the Americans. So, How could they be targeting? There was no, to begin with, there was nothing uh, of that product being exported. The incentives regime is completely neutral during 63 to 73. What is the growth rate? Nine and a half percent. There is zero targeting at this time. Now, by early 70s, a bunch of things happened. Americans decided that they were going to cut back quite a bit on, on their military presence in Korea. And that meant that, you know, a lot of the expenditures they were doing will no longer be there. Also, there were some pressures beginning to develop in the U.S. and U.S. against this, some of the meat exports of Korea. Korea was exporting a lot of steel to the United States. So some protectionist sentiment was boiling in the United States against Korean exports and all. So they felt that, you know, they need to do something. So then some industrial targeting at that time started. 
But now if you look at the next decade, 1974 to 1984, growth rate dips to below 7%. You know, whatever that, the years you can look up, you know, because again, actually by the early 80s, Korea had already turned around. I mean, even probably late 1970s. So this is just six, seven years during which some targeting happened during which growth rate was not 9.5%, it was at least 2 percentage point or 3 percentage point below. So it was despite industrial <laughs> licensing and targeting that Korea managed to do so well because of its trade policy. Absolutely, yeah. And some people like Ha Jun Chang, etc. really tried to make a, their case by saying that, oh look, you know, we protected the auto industry and it is such a successful industry today. Well, this is a post hoc fallacy. Post hoc, ergo preptor hoc or something, whatever you say. After this, therefore, because of this. But I've never understood because just because you did something before and eventually some industry succeeds. It doesn't mean anything. And moreover, what about the ones that, that, that failed? I don't have it in the book, but actually Anne Kruger pointed out to me that they put up this in very, very large ball uh, bearing factory in Korea. And it was so inefficient. There was no way it could compete on the global marketplace. And it was so large that the Korean market was not large enough to consume it. And so it became a white elephant and eventually it had to be closed down. Nobody remembers it. You see, only successes are remembered. Failures are gone. So that also gives a bit of a bias to this. And this debate happened, by the way, between Ian Little and Robert Wade. Because Robert Wade was saying that Korea grew pretty well with this industrial policy. And to say that without industrial policy it would have grown even faster, is far less credible than the opposite. So to which Ian Little replied that, uh, well, Taiwan actually intervened less and did grow faster than South Korea. So why does Mr. Wade think that, <laughs> that uh, Korea would not have grown faster with less interventions? I want to ask you about the industrial policy interventions in India specifically. You know, I mean, most people are familiar with the license permit Raj, erstwhile, and a lot of it still remains. You know, I mean, we might have dismantled the licensing system in large parts, but the permit Raj in India in some sense is still alive, right? Like to sell land, to get change of use certificates, to hire labor, to fire labor, to change the task of labor. Even now, we need permissions for so many things, especially in factor markets, which are inputs for virtually every kind of manufacturing. So now coming to this license permit Raj bit, if we think about international trades and tariffs specifically, now tariffs are a tax on foreign producers, right? And the logic is that if we impose tariffs, then, you know, we tax the foreign producer and therefore incentivize or benefit relatively the domestic producer. Now, industrial licensing and permitrage in India does the exact opposite, right? It taxes the domestic producer. So in some sense, even after we have reduced tariffs and we've allowed foreign producers, our domestic manufacturer is not able to compete in the global markets in the same way that you saw in, say, South Korea when they opened up to the rest of the world. What do you make of this argument and how does one solve for it? Yeah, no, there's a concrete example of what you're saying from India. You remember that we spoke earlier about how the all the labor-intensive products were left for cottage industry. Now, 1969, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi actually formalized that into a policy. And, and she created this list in the industrial policy called small-scale industries list. And that list will carry the products which were allowed to be produced only on small-scale industry basis. Therefore, you know, what was basically a policy anyway, even under Nehru, became formalized that these products are to be produced, are to be reserved only for small-scale manufacturers. Now come what happens. 91, we launched our reform. And all licensing was gone on only capital goods and intermediate inputs. Final goods, consumer goods were still not liberalized. Come 2001, the US challenged us for that in the WTO, won the case, and 2001, we had to liberalize everything. All license, import licensing had to be given up. Now, whatever was under small scale industries reservation could be imported now from abroad. Those guys were producing on large scale. Chinese were not, had no small scale industries reservation, only we had it. So, what we said, oh, foreign guys who are producing it can produce on large scale. But my own manufacturers cannot produce on large scale. 
I mean, it was a crazy situation. And even then, we took a long time to completely eliminate that small scale industries reservation list. The last 20 items actually went out under Prime Minister Modi. <laughs> so the question you're raising is that why was there no pressure from the domestic industry? And the answer really is simple that those who were producing these things were producing on small scale. They had no interest in a large scale, you know, they didn't want. And the probably quality of the product domestically produced one was low enough that, you know, they were not perfect substitutes for what was being imported, you know. So what was being imported was higher quality, but probably also higher price. And also, by the way, there was some tariff protection. So like on clothing, right, clothing, large scale manufacturers did start coming and some, uh, some imports did occur. But this was subject to very high tariffs. So that protection also kicked, kicked in. The really sorry state of India today is that with this 50 plus years of small scale manufacturing of all the products in which India has the potentially comparative advantage because of this massive workforce, right? Industry mindset also has become such that none of the large industrialists wants to do it. I mean, I sometimes they have become very hardwired to manufacturing information technology products, to doing pharmaceuticals, to doing machinery products, to doing petroleum refining, you name auto, auto parts. They want to do all this. But making shoes, stitching clothes, no, that's not for us. I mean, I sometimes say that there's a Brahminical attitude of the Indian industrialists. But do you think that's because the margins in some of those goods are so small, you have to be so competitive and there is something about the Indian production system which doesn't allow that, either because of the labor regime or the difficulties in acquiring land or infrastructure and most importantly, the domestic transport costs are so high in India. By the time you get some of these things to the ports, you know, you might lose all your competitive margin. In one sense, yes, you're right. There might be some elitism and some preference explanation. But I think there also has to be some cost explanation, right? Bangladesh is able to do this and they also have a thriving elitism and caste system, very South Asian. They're exactly like us. But they're able to compete so well in garments and footwear in a way that we are absolutely not able to do at all. We are completely paralyzed. Yeah, Shruti, all very good points, actually. But first, uh, very quickly on Bangladesh, of course, you know, they don't have that history of small-scale industries as a way. They don't. So that's very different. And, and they also let the Korean manufacturers actually come into Bangladesh very early on. So foreign investors also catalyzed some of the domestic industry. So a little different history made a big difference, right? And they did not have to deal with this socialism in the way we had to, whereby these Bombay mills, remember 1980s, you know, Datta Samant, these massive strikes, all that is into the heads of the industrialists. So that was my sort of theory of the industrialists. But what all the points you make are extremely important, very good ones. And I agree with you that a lot needs to be done to make this labor-intensive industry tick in, in India. However, is it not incumbent upon the industry associations? Forget, I don't expect individual industrialists to come and say, do this or do that. Because industrialists say, well, these are my rules. I'll do what is most profitable for me. That's what they do. Fair enough. But industry associations, FICI, so Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, CII, the Confederation of Indian Industry, as associations, do they not have some obligation to come in and say that, look, government... Do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, these 10 things. And then I assure you that I got a lot of these industrialists waiting who would just jump into these industries, create these great jobs for very large number of workers. You've never seen that happen. Yeah, they've become complete rent-seeking chambers, right? In one sense, they are only lobbying for protectionism and they're only lobbying to make sure that the people who've already gotten on the bus, already in this entrepreneurial class, can preserve their rents in some sense and keep the competition out. Exactly. You see, so this is the comfort level and not at the end of the day, then who is left to make this push for reforms? It's yours truly, you know, I mean, meaning some people, very few people who actually play for reforms in India. So, you know, on the reform question, I want to take two steps back. And this is really inspired from your book. So when one reads your book, it's like you explain very clearly that 
you are telling us something that has been a truth for more than 250 years right you start with adam smith you talk about the contributions of ricardo and comparative advantage of henry george of you know frederick bastia so all these great economists who have consistently talked about gains from trade how the wealth of nations comes from gains from trade and how protectionism is just a terrible idea and they've dismantled all this infant industry and frederick bastia of course wrote great satirical pieces of how the candle makers are petitioning the government to save them from competition that comes from the sun right so you walk us through this incredible history of thought which is really rich and even despite having this huge body of work and now your book which is showing all the contemporary studies somehow this is not intuitive right that free trade and prosperity are so closely linked it has just not penetrated the traditional zero sum way of thinking so where do you see that in india since you've also been in policy and also been in the academy is it with the bureaucrats is it the political class is it the rent seeking lobby which is you know propagating these myths is it the average citizen who has no understanding of economics like why are these truths not self evident yeah okay so first you know i would put a slightly different lens on on what the reality is and i think you know all said and done we have scored lots of victories i think the markets today are way way more open than at any point in history i mean developing and developed you know if you start post early to mid 1990s even the developing countries have opened up in a big way nobody has the, the kinds of tariffs and protection that india had in the 1991 you know nobody i mean at least i don't know if any there may exist but you know at least there may be some tiny small country which may have that but but not to my knowledge we have most certainly scored huge amount of victory i want to be in that sense a bit optimistic that that let's not lose sight of Fair that enough. victory now nevertheless there is no doubt that the protectionist forces keep asserting themselves and i remember i think this was either at a presentation or somewhere i remember paul samuelson once saying this fighting protectionism is like fighting the skin disease you fight it in one place and it <laughs> appears in another place <laughs> so uh, so it is like that and you remember we earlier talked about the the korean industrial targeting and so forth right import substitution in the early 70s to late 70s right that 6 7 year period how did that happen right i i think what happens is now this i'm speaking a bit more anecdotally but but it seems to me that you know once you liberalize you succeed your exports expand dramatically happen to korea and of course the whole purpose of expanding exports is to expand imports i mean most people don't think of it this way but the fact is that if you are not getting anything in return there will be no purpose to exporting i mean you may as well take these goods and throw into the uh, harbor and you have exported but you didn't want any imports in return so why are you getting out of shape right the whole point is that you are exporting to somebody so that you get for an exchange in return which you can use to import something right so so imports also expand so by this time you know the exports are almost close to 30% and south korea in early 70s imports are even more because there is there is actually trade deficit so imports are even more and the, you know the incredible thing that i noticed in the book when you talk about as exports increase imports also increase is that very often they are exporting and importing the same class of goods but they are doing different varieties right so the kind of steel they are producing in south korea is different from the kind of steel they are importing in south korea but they are doing both simultaneously probably because you need a particular kind of steel as an input for some other industry which is now an export right right absolutely absolutely and and this is the kind of the krugman style kind of specialization in in variety particularly if you're a smaller economy then you want to specialize in a handful of the varieties which you also export right if you are really good at it then you also export those varieties and import the rest so that's very absolutely very true but now what happens shruti in the korean case is i think that when you then see that oh, 30 to 35% of my goods are being imported then some smart kind of smart in quotes you know bureaucrat or a policy maker politician begins to think that why am i importing this you know i should produce it at home and that is what is happening today in india very same thing if you look at it you know in 91 imports are only 10% of the gdp why 
2012 13 they have gone to something like 30% and then they begin to see that somehow they don't connect this is the hardest part i think you know that i find in in natural policy interactions to explain that look you know you restrict imports your exports will automatically go on the side it's a given that is not seen so they think that i can continue to export what i am exporting but i can cut the imports and produce it domestically so my gdp would rise and i'll create more jobs but it's actually the other way around right because you can import you can import it cheap which means your exports are more competitive and you know this is classically like india's current pharmaceutical industries we are huge exporters of generic pharmaceuticals but we are huge importers of the chemicals that are required to produce the generic pharmaceuticals so without the import there's no export so now do you think this misunderstanding comes from this you know two country two good stupid economic models or do you think it comes from some other kind of thinking you know economic nationalism or something like you know patriotism self sufficiency like where is this what's the root cause of this misunderstanding have economists messed things up by making these abstract models no i i, I think the economists have sort of they've not done enough to push the idea that look you know openness is what leads to success in the countries and where is the evidence is there it's not read by everybody that's part of the problem and the other part of the problem is that of course you know in our profession we got some very powerful voices which say that no 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 some bit of import substitution is good you know we got my colleague here joe stickles we got danny rodrick you know not a, not many but certainly a few very i must say strong powerful voices and they they provide the intellectual kind of uh, support to the policy makers you know who then love to quote these economists say that look you know this is what professor rodrick of harvard or professor stiglitz of columbia university nobel laureate says and so forth so that makes it a little harder but on the other side also the economists who believe that uh, that free trade has been good have not done enough to to push the ideas in the public domain and as you know bestia kind of you know 170 years ago already said it's much easier for the politicians to see that look you know if i protect then output goes up yeah. and i can see that if i protect steel steel output goes up but at what cost that's the unseen effect at what cost and that's unseen yeah you know and and in the end exports will fall and as you said just now exports is what you were good at that has shrunken and import competing which is what you are not good at and that is expanded so your gdp actually will decline on net you know so but that's what is harder to see and and most politicians think my export is given and so if i add to the imports i mean add to the output of import competing goods that's extra gdp that's just fundamental misunderstanding i mean even politicians can see c plus i plus g plus x minus m <laughs> right and if my x is x is given and if minus m i i i reduce that then my gdp has gone up yeah so the x is not given that's the part that they they don't quite quite understand so before i come to india you know india is also now as you said it's the old wine in a new bottle now it used to be nehruvian self sufficiency now it is atmanirbharta and there is this it's mired in multiple things it's mired in economic nationalism but what i'm really surprised in india is after seeing and viscerally feeling the gains from three decades post liberalization now all the old arguments are back so you know there's of course the infant industry protection that argument somehow just never dies right it's like whack a mole it keeps coming back the other part of it is you know there is some security concerns with now the the border conflict with china that you know we need to we need to think about strategic interests and things we shouldn't rely so much on imports from a from a partner with whom we might have a conflict so there's some of that mired into this then there is of course the whole we can make in india right uh, now the make in india banner started out as make it productively in india and use and export but now it has kind of flipped on its head as make in india and be self sufficient so it's very nehruvian 
and comes with it you know the same points of diversification problems in coordination i haven't heard any externality arguments yet but i'm sure you know they will also come i'm sure some economist is going to talk about capital market imperfection or some of the old nonsense comes back so how do you think about that in the present form is there any merit or is it the same thing all over again and all the myths that you have been busting for such a long time i can't think that there is any new argument here i just don't think there is any new argument here i mean particularly this infant industry argument is being made there is no doubt now actually it's not just infant industry it's the entire indian manufacturing is infant it all needs protection right that too um, but particularly specific industries you know like mobile phones etc that we are um, protecting now then of course some of the import sub- uh, substitution we have never given up auto industry 125% tariffs i mean who imposes in modern times tariffs of 125% but there is no effort to and the industry has done so badly in the sense of you know with that kind of protection it has never been export industry in the world markets its share is only 1% less than 1% so but all the arguments i would say have been there the china one is a little different you could say Now that's a strategic one and i sort of accept that that you know country has to worry about the geopolitics of, of what you do in terms of economic policy also i'm sort of sensitive to that and in the context of rcep the regional comprehensive economic partnership which is a free trade agreement amongst the, uh, these currently 15 countries and india would have been 16th originally i was very much pushing very hard for it to join it yeah to join but i think post galwan events on the ladakh border which is the border conflict between india and china in the ladakh border so they after that i sort of backed off on that because i think you know in china politics ultimately trumps economics and particularly when it comes to international trade it will trump it so you know i have a question on china specifically so now india and china are involved in the border conflict and we all understand that there needs to be some changes made in economic policy because of the geopolitics you know that i think we can all concede but there are some really bad ideas going around in policy circles and you know the external affairs ministry and things like that so one is some people want unilateral discriminatory tariffs on china Now the problem with this is you know one of course China will retaliate which then you don't want to get in a trade war with China they usually retaliate quite badly but the other problem is that India's largest share of imports comes from China right and so those automatically become more costly which means inputs into indian manufacturing for instance pharmaceuticals become more costly so in a sense it might impose some costs on china but it's imposing an even larger cost on fellow indians another even worse idea in my opinion that is being thrown around is then just impose non discriminatory tariffs across the board right so that china doesn't get excluded and doesn't retaliate specifically and we have higher tariffs across the board and we make more in india but according to me that's an even worse idea in some sense right you're really cutting your nose to spite your face and you know now instead of 16% imports that come from china you're punishing 100% of imports that come from everywhere which just makes no sense to me on the free trade optimism end i have heard some libertarian friends say things like oh actually we should increase our trade with china because that's you know trading partners never get into war so you know there's that extreme argument and then there is a realistic argument i think and you know some trade realism which says maybe we start looking for other trading partners and reduce our reliance on china but not through tariffs but by other free trade agreements with other countries so how do you think about this china problem because all these four ideas keep coming up in some way or the other in the newspapers clearly we shouldn't do a non discriminatory tariff against china what i have said one thing is that you know where we have very direct security threat like tiktok so th- those we ban and that's okay i think wherever there is a very direct threat 5g for example there may be a direct threat so if you want to exclude china from 5g i think we should do that so that's one step the second in terms of actual trade with china where there is no direct security threat only an indirect one in the sense that somebody sitting in the politburo may make telephone calls that or stop importing such and such from india so imports from india begin to be stopped and all that sort of threat i think we need to deal with it but i would say let's deal with it slowly right now china is not giving us any of those threats but to prepare let's move our trade away from china and the natural thing to do is to liberalize your trade with the other countries 
so forge as many free trade agreements as you can with countries that are not china so you know on that margin we haven't been very successful i mean we have some free trade agreements with japan and south korea and singapore and things like that but they make up i believe less than 10% of our total trade so how does one move towards having genuine free trade agreements with really large trading partners and here i mean you know of course the quadrilateral partners you know us australia and things like that but also the european union is a really potentially large partner the middle east where we get a lot of remittances from where also we get a lot of oil from is a potentially very large trading partner so how do you go about striking really significant free trade agreements with these partners and why hasn't it happened yet like what's the roadblock in in forming these partnerships yeah you know if there was will by now we should have had an agreement already with the european union and we should be now proceeding towards the united kingdom it's the problem of the will and in my experience our commerce ministry bureaucrats tend to be very reductionist even if you know the the higher authority meaning the prime minister or his office wants progress often this is how the commerce ministry will proceed it will go to the european union and say that well we really want to have free trade agreement with you but you know our competitive advantage is in services what you need to do for us is to allow our workers to come into your country to provide the services and of course this is an immigration issue everywhere so they was a, sorry this is not a good starting point we can't talk with you then the commerce ministry comes into the prime minister or his office says that well we want to talk to european union but they don't want to talk with us and the matter ends there so they're privileging the interests of a tiny elite educated tech and english class at the cost of the entire agriculture and manufacturing classes in india in some sense see I, i'm not i'm just not sure whether they are sacrificing those other interests to protect these interests or they are using them to be protectionists to to stop any agreement i mean my own uh, kind of interpretation is that they use these things to prevent any opening up so there is no genuine good faith attempts to create free trade agreements that's the roadblock at least at the level of the commerce ministry that at least is a very strong sense and this is irrespective of governments and irrespective of you know bureaucrats it's been the trend for a long time yeah and it's it's particularly the entrenched bureaucracy within commerce ministry see the way the indian ministries work there is a permanent bureaucracy within the ministry the top leadership changes the joint secretary the commerce and the minister of course changes and minister they change as you know from arun shuri's book an old one called governance every file begins at the bottom official and it works like a silo and then the file kind of begins it travels up to the higher and higher level official and by which time enough notings have been done that nobody at the top wants to change i mean i was different in niti ayog i used to i in fact didn't even used to read what the people at the below wrote i mean i just looked at the issue and then made up my mind and after i had made up my mind then i will read what the others wrote so <laughs> i was different but but that's not how the, the the bureaucracies actually work so these old ideas never die as a result they don't die yeah they keep coming back i mean i think i'm exaggerating because you know if in in an extreme form that was true then no change would happen but we have seen changes happening and so forth but most of the changes have been initiated from the top not from the bottom you know typically the changes whenever they have happened they have happened from the top and i think this is where we need to make up our minds you know but if we think that somehow we got short changed in our ftas with south korea and with japan etc because we didn't get opening up of services etc i think then you know you begin to not go further any further and that to some degree has been happening that the, even the political leadership seems to think you know i don't know why they think so i don't think that, that that evidence is correct also this thing always plays negatively that you know if i my imports expanded more than my exports expanded then i think that that was a bad thing to have happened whereas you know the economics of this free trade agreements would tell you that you know if your imports are expanding at the expense of your domestic inefficient producers that's a good thing that's not the bad thing that's what we call trade creation Yes and it's more money in the pockets of your consumers your citizens Exactly exactly But this is also a fallacy that doesn't go away even in developed countries right everyone thinks trade deficit is a bad thing 
No, no, absolutely. So, but, but that is what economists need to continuously explain. There are two parts to the argument, which comes directly from the book, which is the free trade and prosperity part, which is that the relationship between outward orientation, that is, you know, either declining or already low tariffs, right, which embrace global trade. The link between these outward orientations and economic growth is really, really strong, right? So now my question is, what are the precise mechanisms through which it alleviates poverty? Because normally, one of the big things that you constantly hear in India is, yeah, but all this free trade is for rich people and it is for the tech sector and it is for the IT sector. But, you know, what about poor farmers? Foreign countries also have tariffs. You know, there's that usual typical argument. Every time I write about more liberalization in any newspaper column, the first thing I hear is, but even developed countries are imposing tariffs. And why? Right? So that, that keeps going on. So if you can walk us through what is the precise mechanism by which this kind of free trade increases growth and thereby alleviates poverty, I think that will be very useful for people to hear. Yeah. You know, if we look back at the successful countries, and here I would say three particular ones, South Korea, Taiwan, and China. I'm choosing those three because they also started with a sizable agricultural sector. Growth, in the case of all three, was driven initially by expanding exports of labor-intensive products. They really expanded. And that, of course, meant that your manufacturing of these products expanded very, very rapidly. Now, what happens in this process is that your share in the, in the GDP of these products begins to grow. But it is not just the share in the GDP that grows. It is also share in employment that grows. So you begin to draw workers from other sectors, principally agriculture. Now, this is across the board, including in India, that the share in GDP of agriculture as, you, as your incomes grow declines and share of services in industry grows. That is inescapable because agriculture, you can grow maybe at, at most 3 to 4%. In good times, best of the times, you will grow over a longer period of time of a decade or decade and a half or more. It will grow 4% in the best of the times. But, you know, usually 3.5% is the best you can do. So any economy that grows faster than 3.5% by sheer arithmetic will actually shift the shares in favor of industry and services. So the GDP share, of course, does change. But the question is that are you also able to change the employment share? And in the case of all these three countries, employment shares of agriculture also decline quite rapidly. I mean, South Korea, you start in, in 1965, was maybe something like 65% in agriculture, drops to about 20% by 1990. I mean, some very dramatic shift of workforce. Now, think about it, you know, as an economist, you would think that so much of workforce is moving into industry. That will cause the wages to collapse, right? So much workers are coming in. But no, in South Korea, wages are rising at 9 to 10% a year. Every year in real terms, you know, is the productivity is rising so rapidly and you are constantly expanding your exports, sending the goods and also this is all good jobs that get created. So in the South Korean case, if you look at it, there were no anti-poverty programs of the kind that we had had in India. So I provide some evidence in the book, you know, there was one small program which very tiny fraction, it was a very, very small fraction of the population that used that program anyway. So it's practically non-existent. Unlike India where, you know, the Narega, the Food Security Act, all kinds of different things we do, you know, all sorts of anti-poverty programs where the government spends large sums of money. None of that in Korea. And by, you know, late 1980s, early or mid-1990s, abject poverty, the extreme poverty is gone from, from South Korea. China is very similar actually, you know, now they kind of, you know, starting from 2000 onwards, I think there's even a story in the current issue of The Economist, where they talk about, you know, their, their anti-poverty programs and all. But that's all very recent origin, you know, but extreme poverty, China had more or less eradicated by mid-2000s. And Taiwan, of course, the same, very similar story. And the mechanism really is that it generates incomes for, for the people. And, and that, of course, you know, even what happens is that when incomes rise of the people through higher wages and better paid jobs, they are also able to access other social services, public services better. You know, if you're dirt poor in a village in India, you know, even if there is free education available or free health services available, you need to be able to go to the center, which may be in village next door or uh, 10 miles away or something. A banking services, same thing. 
you need the means to be able to get there. So, you know, rising incomes helps. And certainly in India, that mechanism worked. You know, when you look at poverty levels, when did the poverty levels fall the most? It was 2004, 5 to 11, 12. I mean, I'm picking up those dates because that's where we had the two surveys, large expenditure surveys, uh, that 2004, 5 and 11, 12. And prior to that, you can look at 93, 94. Poverty decline across almost every single group, whether it is the overall rural poverty, urban poverty, scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, you take it. Every group experiences much larger and accelerated decline in poverty 4, 5 to 11, 12. Then between 93, 94 and 4, 5, although that period is 11 years, this period is uh, what, 7 years or something. And yet absolute decline is, is, is a lot more in this second period. And almost, as I said, across the board. Also, you can, of course, you know, I also believe that anti-poverty programs are a good thing to do because you can double up, you can accelerate accelerate the process. But, you know, there can't be anti-poverty programs unless you have grown. Growth has to be there to give you the revenues. An anti-poverty program is different from import substitution and tariffs, right? You can have outward-looking economy while simultaneously having an anti-poverty program or universal basic income or something like that. Those two are not necessarily mutually exclusive, or at least that's... Yeah, no, no, not only that. Not only that. In fact, if, if you are not open, you are not going to grow, you will not have the revenues. That's true. Absolutely. You need revenues to do anti-poverty programs. I mean, today, can we do a universal basic income in India? No chance. Even America cannot do it because there's not enough revenues. No, absolutely. And, you know, one of the interesting things, I was recently speaking with Chandrabhan Prasad, you know, who has written a lot on Dalit capitalism. And, you know, one of the really interesting things he told me was, he said liberalization really helped Dalit entrepreneurs because prior to that, when you had this industrial licensing system, only people who could reach the chambers to get the licenses got the licenses and Dalits were never among that elite group who would even have access to those spaces. So the moment you eliminate this licensing system and you know you can create a good product and find a market for it and a lot of the Dalit capitalists according to him make generics you know he's in fact uh, telling them now to start branding these goods but initially they started out making generics that they would supply to other entrepreneurs and he said we were able to do it because we finally did not require anybody's permission. So it's not just, you know, poverty levels, but it's also changes within socioeconomic groups in a particular way because of liberalization. And this idea never occurred to me because, you know, we just look at aggregate numbers. We don't look at within group sort of disaggregated changes within these social groups. No, absolutely. In fact, you know, in, in my earlier book with Jagdish Bhagwati, The Why Growth Matters, I think somewhere we quote actually Chandrabhan. Because there was, you know, this was very much in news in those days also uh, <laughs> that, you know, apparently the planning commission invited some of the Dalit entrepreneurs and all. There was this famous story that came out in the newspapers that uh, apparently I think Montek Aluwalia, who was the deputy chairman of the planning commission, asked them, you know, that how many of them had been helped in their success by the government. The story says that not a single hand went up. <laughs> These were stories of Dalit Karodpatis. That's an incredible story. So now that we've talked about, you know, the different socioeconomic groups, there's a question of inequality. And I want to talk about inequality and free trade from two different points of view, one in developing countries and one in developed countries. So in developing countries, I mean, you know, all the usual arguments that free trade has only helped the IT sector and the English speaking elite and those sorts of things. It's never really helped the regular folks and the poor man. The other part of that argument comes from how developed nations impose tariffs on agricultural produce and tend to be very highly protectionist on agriculture, which, you know, of course, is going to be a disadvantage for India, where so many Indians rely on agriculture in terms of, you know, the, the labor share in the population. So there are a lot of free trade naysayers on the margin of inequality that, you know, the gains from free trade, you know, even if we recognize them, will not be shared equally. Now, what is the global experience with that? And what is the Indian experience with that? There is a sh short chapter in my book on inequality and uh, openness. So you can look at it from, you know, in my thinking anyway, openness works through growth. And so if you look at these periods of growth and changes in inequality, evidence doesn't show you anything. I mean, you, know, you can look at all these Gini coefficients and all. I mean, you can plot them against growth rates and you'll just see the dots all over the place. I mean, there is no pattern to that. 
So for sure, you know, as measured by Gini coefficient, right, you, you don't see that. Much of the debate in the U.S., of course, happened on wages, that unskilled to skilled wages. There also, I think a lot of that debate only relied on the relative wages, but you also have to look at the real wages. And certainly you don't see any relationship, you know, certainly the real wage trade has not, I mean, there's some work by Rob Feenstra shows that it, in the end did not hurt any of the real wages trade by itself. But in the developing country context, one thing I always say is that ultimately, to me, it is poverty that trumps inequality. Even if it so happens that inequality rises a little bit as a result of this growth, if I'm really massively cutting poverty, I'm willing to take that trade-off. You know, do you want everybody to be left poor as we were for 50 years? So your argument is that the overall level has to increase, the size of the pie has to increase. Especially if, if I'm starting dirt poor, where everybody is poor. I mean, <laughs> there was an interesting uh, conversation that Jagdish Bhagwati often tells me that one of these Polish economists, I'm forgetting the name, but he, used to, he visited India once and he would tell Jagdish, you know, that, you know, Bhagwati, the problem of India is that there are too many poor to whom to redistribute and too few rich from whom to redistribute. So, you know, you, you just don't have that. <laughs> and, and you can see that. I mean, I have somewhere written that in the 60s or even 70s, if you distributed equally India's entire income, that will put every single individual below that any sensible, any, any kind of acceptable poverty line. Because that's how low the bloody income was. One important thing that I think a lot of the free trade critics miss is that because of cheap imports with an outward orientation, if imports become really cheap, you actually dramatically reduce consumption inequality. You know, not all inequality is income inequality or wealth inequality, right? Like if you get a huge influx of cheap cell phones from China, that means that most people I know, like my parents, their maid and their driver have a cellular phone. It's a smartphone. Now, it's not the same as my Apple phone, but it does 90% of what my phone does, maybe more, right? So in that sense, consumption inequality has just collapsed on certain margins if you allow cheap imports to come in. In fact, right now with school closures, so many people children from even poorer backgrounds and marginalized backgrounds, of course, not all of them have access, but a lot of them are able to cope because there is a smartphone in the household, right? And that smartphone was likely imported from some Chinese manufacturer and is really cheap compared to any other smartphone that Indians could make. Absolutely. Great equalizer. And now what is India doing actually? India is imposing these tariffs so that we can produce these things at home, assembly mostly. Who are you then disadvantaging? This is precisely your driver and your, you know, whoever was getting this cheap. You know, so now I want to change gears from global trade to domestic market for a minute. So, you know, one major difference between China and India and all the Asian tigers, there was this people kept saying, oh, those are really small countries and so on. Now... India is large enough that even despite having 125% tariffs on automobiles and having this horrible policy, we still have somewhat of an auto sector because domestic demand is just so large that we can even then chug along. So if we think about it, I mean, if we count all the states and union territories, we are talking about, you know, roughly three dozen entities. Think of them as three dozen small and large countries. Now, one of the biggest strengths of the American founding was that they managed to create a free trade zone within the United States of America, right? So even though America was dirt poor when it started out, the free trade zone permitted that there were no domestic barriers. Now, India does not have a single large domestic market. So now what are some of the barriers in that process? So one, of course, was all the tariffs, I mean, basically indirect taxes, which got collapsed into GST. GST could get better, but at least it's a start on having one single country and one single market. But what are some of the other factors? Is the problem domestic demand because it's a poorer country? Is the problem infrastructure? Is the problem, you know, some other kind of fractionalization that I'm not imagining? Is it linguistic? Is it geographical? Like, why can't we get our act together and make India a single free trade zone? Yeah, a lot of legacy, right? I mean, when you compare to America... What was the presence of the government during those years in America? Very little. 
and so the robber barons were there to to sort of roam the country and do what they wanted to do but the robber barons also helped build the railways right and connect all of america so <laughs> yeah no no but that's precisely what i meant i mean today if you think you know in india if somebody wants to build private railways yeah it's impossible <laughs> you know <laughs> you can't even build a rail line from your industry to the port no, you know no even if you want to just run a private train that's a challenge in india so it's the omnipresence of the government which is such a problem you mentioned three dozen entities but you don't mention the three dozen governments <laughs> each of those each of those you know each state has its government and each uh, and then the central government and all you know so so we we have created this maze of regulations i always say you know when people like nanny rodrick go and say that oh you know this laundry list of reforms you talk about and all but why not just look for you know two or three binding constraints and they've gone in to advise a lot of these african countries on you know how to identify the binding constraints and all i mean i tell you challenge you know you if you can tell me the binding constraints in india you know you can tell them but what you would do is you remove one layer which is the today binding the moment you remove that layer there is a second layer right below which is binding right below i mean I, you know we had this uh, small scale industry reservation well first we had the licensing then we had the small scale industry reservation then we had the labor laws then we got the land problem then we got electricity rates are very high there's so many of these things which still but on the other hand i don't want to leave it so pessimistic either that we have done actually a good job of removing lot of these restrictions i think you know within last 5 6 years under the prime minister five six very big reforms we cut the corporate profit tax big time we put in place a very modern insolvency and bankruptcy code very important gst single nationwide uh, indirect tax we got the labor laws and we are also doing something on the marketing of the farm products so let's say you know whether it's labor laws or farm products labor of course but land is very important yeah so you know labor we have free movement of labor and you know we had this migrant crisis recently which just taught us how many people leave the village to actually go work at the city so you know labor movement has not been an enormous constraint whether seasonal or year round that's been happening but what stops goods and services from moving across india so i'll give you an example this has become my pet peeve in india right so i mean my family is south indian but i grew up in delhi i've never found the banana chips that i would like to eat in north of india you know and you go to kerala or you go to tamil nadu you get like 30 different kinds of banana chips they are fresh they are amazing but you cannot get them in the north and if you go and talk to these sellers one of course they're very small scale but they say even if you are willing to package it by the time the transportation cost and you know it reaches bombay or it reaches delhi the cost per packet will be 3 350 rupees and then we can't compete nobody in delhi is going to pay 350 rupees for banana chips because the die hard south indians will make it at home i actually get better and fresher banana chips in the united states you know at the indian store then i get in delhi so one example of this is the transport cost so what are some of the big barriers in just trade becoming bigger because you know the farm bills that you mentioned the goal is to allow farmers to sell anywhere in india but my question is do we have the infrastructure for farmers to sell anywhere in india what are those infrastructural constraints what are the warehousing constraints transportation constraints so how does one get around those kinds of problems in making india a unified market personally i think actually the, the problem is coming from the size of the enterprises i think our enterprises tend to be very small so you think if the size increase they would have their own storage and warehousing and transport is that the argument i mean now the farm laws of course were required because until these farm laws you can't move the product across state borders in the first place so the no infrastructure would then come into you know which is specific to these moments also the essential commodities act problem was there that if you stored anything on a large scale then you could be put in jail right at least laws could be invoked that also we have done done away with so this is these are all three three laws that that have been put in place now are complementary they complement each other that you know now people can begin to so it will follow i think it will take time it's not that easy and right now of course there is a lot of resistance to even these reforms by at least two states punjab and haryana so all that i think will have to be sorted out 
but in general the problem in the kinds of products you are talking like you know banana chips it is a scale problem everything we do on small scale that mindset for all these consumer oriented goods everything that was on small scale industries as a vision list still mindset remains you know none of the big guys wants to enter so we have very very few i mean apparel is the my favorite example you got more at most two or three entrepreneurs who have some scale otherwise these are all small little tailor shops you know how do you succeed so i think that is the the key the key for india to to address the scale of the enterprises still remains you know in the data you see some movement but it's incredibly slow it's incredibly slow you know so the typical factors like india is a poor country and domestic demand is low all that is nonsense of course that's nonsense because who is stopping you i mean when this is my critique of the indian auto industry you know there was about 6 months ago or prior to covid about a year ago let's say you know they were complaining that oh we are suffering there is no demand and all so i said who is stopping you from exporting why don't you export you got a 2 trillion or some you know some very large export market there in auto but they're not competitive this is the problem i mean even to the domestic guys you are selling at one and a half times the price and that automobile is not exactly the same quality as what i get in the united states you can take a camry in the united states and you can take whatever is the equivalent model in in india and you'll see the quality differences i mean i don't mean toyota as such but you know i'm just saying any particular car you know these guys will not give you the same international quality and you have to charge one and a half times the price so who are we helping here yeah so if you protect people from competition they won't be competitive yeah why should they why should they how did you become an economist and how did you become a trade economist <laughs> first becoming economist was a sheer accident you know because uh, like any other father my father also wanted me to become an indian administrative services ias officer and that was the top elite indian civil service so that's what he more or less you know groomed me for and in my generation you know largely fathers or, or parents were very influential people over the children they could persuade them so i basically studied to to become that interesting story here which is that due to some sheer coincidence uh, i happened to be after i finished my ma masters and was would have then taken the civil service exams i was underage by a month or two so what do you do right so then you that year you couldn't take the exams and so you do it for the next year so that is when i became a lecturer at rajasthan university and you know i was just copying my brother who is an engineer who had been applying to and had been accepted at stanford although he never then because he couldn't get funding he didn't go but i said i am also going to apply abroad and i was getting 750 rupees salary so that was good enough for this postage etc you know because applications were expensive and all but i was not serious obviously i was not serious so uh, i never actually took any gres and i basically about six seven universities to which i applied and i just said that look you know gres are not given in my hometown and it's very difficult to go to another to delhi and give the and all so like yale said no without gres we don't consider but uh, other some other schools considered it so i got admitted to princeton cornell and uh, chicago totally unexpected i couldn't believe it because you know rajasthan university i was not at delhi school if you are at delhi school then of course everybody knows but i was at rajasthan university nobody from rajasthan university had ever gone to any of these universities to do phd but then there was still the issue of money because i couldn't you know princeton gave me the fellowship <laughs> so you went to princeton <laughs> so even then i actually you know because my father was so that i should do ias so i still wrote to princeton saying that look you know can you delay my coming by a year and the idea was that during that year i would uh, take the ias and if i get selected then fine i'll not go to princeton if not then i'll go so they said that well you know we can defer your admission but we can't defer your financial aid i had gone to hindi schools so i was very skeptical that i'll get into ias you know because you know normally you you would do okay maybe in the written exam but when it goes to interview you have to fluently speak in english and all at least in those days after that things have changed now the rules have changed completely so i was afraid so I, then i told father that look you know <laughs> i don't want to miss this chance and and my 
brother who who is now a very famous neurologist in India he supported me <laughs> so i came to princeton and princeton was a trade trade economist school at that time now trade how i got into was i think a lot of credit to to my teacher who gave the course in trade he was brilliant you know uh, it was carlos rodriguez at the year i was doing my trade courses my local professors peter cannon and bill branson they were both on leave so Carlos used to be a professor at associate professor at Columbia University so they they got him to come and give the course and he would you know drive down one morning uh, friday and do a 3 hour class he was brilliant he was absolutely brilliant and he was paper machine you know he used to produce papers at a rate nobody else could and in all in the top journals and all and that really got me very excited about international trade so i think in this case a teacher was very the teacher was very, because you know your obvious inclination coming from india is that you will do development economics exactly but you know the funny thing about your book is you show that trade economics is development economics that is true too yeah no no in fact so it was a good good happy thing because eventually i went to development economics yeah no because i mean there is no development program which has led to the kind of prosperity in south korea and taiwan and china that can compete with the trade policies right so yeah and even india right the years of high growth 2000 about 3 to 11 9 years of 8% plus growth that's trade yeah so i would actually argue that you are a development economist <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no so i mean no, i'm not the development economist of the kind that is respected in the profession today which is unfortunate it tells you something about the profession also right in a sensible world all trade economists would be considered development economists and then you know you might actually have a shot at slightly better policies but you know you also have a unique advantage you served of course you know famously in prime minister modi's cabinet at the niti aayog Can you share your experience with trade and development policy as an academic on the one hand versus as a policy maker on the other like what are the really big differences because this is a sort of fork in the career of lot of young scholars do we go into policy or do we go into the academy no i i say that if you are a, a really solid good economist then for a while still stay in the academy, in the academy don't go so quickly because you should generally you know establish your credentials and be a good solid research economist because you have to earn the respect of your colleagues also even if what you do as a scholar in the academy may not be necessary let's say for what you would do in policy you certainly not you i mean you know i won't use my trade models to apply to you know but still first to have the respect of your peers very important so you have to do that and it also when you go into these debates with the others in policy field that is if they got a doctorate and they are famous economists and you're not you are left at a disadvantage and so therefore all these things are are very important but at the same time i also feel that you know at least my field in international trade and this also you know to some degree comes from jagdish bhagwati who has been always my mentor for life he always says that look you know trade is an applied field in the end you know so we we have to think in terms of policy also and his own trajectory has been like that of course in the, you know, although he never actually worked in the government certainly you know he saw and advised many people you know certainly the eminent policy makers and so forth and all of us got influenced by his writings there is no doubt about that so he always says that look you know in the end we have to translate this into policy so that's how i sort of came about what i think little bit different in my case than jagdish's was that i've written very regularly for more than 20 years now in the indian press and i think that was very helpful actually you know uh, doing once i started and more or less remained once a month occasionally i'll do twice but usually once a month that i took very seriously and that i always took very seriously even now sometimes i end up spending two days three days looking through researching writing rewriting the columns you know i don't take it like you know ah this newspaper requested so quickly one hour i'll write it out and all you know what is it on my cv nothing that's not how i take it i take it very seriously because that is where you are influencing the wider audience that is also where you may influence some policy maker you know and we will never see this connection that you know that because you wrote some something happened that connection for us academics is impossible to see 
But at the same time, if you believe in the cause, then it's a very long drawn, long battle for ideas and you have to really keep doing it. And I, one thing I often say is that, you know, and, and that's reflected in all my policy writings, is that in policy, repetition is not a vice, it's a virtue. You have to keep saying the same thing in different ways, in different contexts. It's so funny you say this because, you know, Frank Knight at University of Chicago, he would say that it takes varied reiterations to force alien concepts upon reluctant minds. <laughs> How beautifully said. How beautifully said. Yeah, he, he being cleverer, obviously said it so much better than I could. So, you know, speaking of writing, you are really prolific. I had scheduled a panel conversation with Arvind on this book last year this time to happen sometime in March, which, of course, we couldn't do because of COVID. So we kept postponing, hoping that one day we'll be able to do it in person. And in the meanwhile, Arvind has already come out with another book <laughs> on India, which I really hope, Arvind, you will come back on our show and we'll talk about that book and India's reform story and have a detailed conversation on that. But you write... Like just, you know, a book every year, every other year and lots of papers and of course your your columns in the popular press. So what is your writing process? Ah, okay. No, I mean, in a way you, you have to like it, right? So for me, my energy really comes from writing. And so I do try to do, I do try to sort of do writing almost every day. But not necessarily because it, reading is also important. But a lot of my readings also, by the way, nowadays, you know, for the last several years actually, happens as a part of writing process you know you want to write something then you you have to know a lot more than the audience for which you are writing and also when you do policy you see now in, in terms of policy also one of the things is that this is going back a little bit to what we were talking earlier is that you often need to know the facts and all what the policies are what the particular context of the discussion and debate is and all one of the problems our academics often have is that you know this thing that I did this research so implement it doesn't work that way effectively if you are going to influence the then those who won the elections those who got the people's mandate are the ones who have their policy agenda laid out right there is a manifesto on which they won the elections and all so you got to embed yourself in that and and see that as a part of that agenda they do the right things but if you say that, oh, you know, this is fantastic randomized control trial, I did it, why don't you do that? It will never happen. But your main question, your main question of, you know, what my own process is, is basically, yeah, I mean, you know, my energy comes from writing. And nowadays, I'm not doing any, almost any of the technical writing, mostly, I think, and, and even my policy writings are basically trade in India. That's the that's sort of a area in which I'm working. But I like to write. When people say that I'm one draft person, I find it hard to believe, you know, I think I do a lot of redrafting because, and what I use, try to do is, particularly if it's a difficult subject, occasional subjects are easy, in which case, you know, you can write it in three, four hours and uh, then next day look at it and clean it up. But when, when it takes longer, then it is also good practice to let it sit for two or three days if you can, if you have the time, and then come back to it with a fresh mind. So then you read it as a reader what you wrote. And then you know that, you know, you haven't written it cleanly enough. And so you go back and clean it up a bit more. So, so that cleaning up process is very, very important. I think that's very, very important. You know, because in the end, you have to see it, try to see it from the viewpoint of the reader. <laughs> so, so I tell you, I mean, <laughs> this is not uh, to praise myself, but because of the podcast we had, I thought I'll at least take a quick look at something in the book and and read read the preface and then some of the earlier portions of it. Felt really good. I said, wow, it, was, it got written clearly. <laughs> the book is actually excellently written. It is not technical, but it incorporates every important economic insight very simply and beautifully. And every single person must read this book. It's literally boiling down the knowledge of 500 odd papers on international trade into, you know, I won't say a popularly written book, but a, but a very easily accessible book in that sense. So I tremendously enjoyed it. In fact, you know, the way I came about the book, I'm almost embarrassed because I know you, Arvind. I've read your other books. I didn't even know you had written this book. And it's actually my colleague at Mercatus, uh, Don Boudreau, 
who told me, "Oh, haven't you read Arvind's book? It's a love letter to free trade." And I said, <laughs> "What a lovely!" I have never heard. Yeah, I said I've never heard anyone describe a book like that. Let me read that immediately. And then I found the book and I read it, and uh, it really is written as accessibly as a love letter uh, to free trade. <laughs> so, what are you currently reading? Well, uh, I finished reading one autobiography, which was of a friend, you know, N. K. Singh. who also played a lot of very important role uh, particularly during atal bihari vajpayee years so i read that book and currently a book i am reading by two young indian scholars it's called uh, a new idea of india this is rajiv and harsh harsh yeah, yeah okay you know most important question during the covid pandemic uh, without which i cannot let you go what are you binge watching <laughs> you know my wife and i are both into korean dramas <laughs> <laughs> do you understand Korean at all, or do you use the subtitles? No, these these all have subtitles. I tell you that you know the acting and everything, the, the storyline and 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 all. Nobody can beat Koreans. I think it's so fantastic. Is there a recommendation that you have of a particular show or a movie? Uh, well, if if you have Netflix, one these are longer things, twenty episodes kind of things. Watch Mr. Sunshine. I'll make a note of that. Yeah, this was so enjoyable, Arvind. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and discussing the book. And I do hope you will promise to come back and discuss the other book. Thanks, Ruti, and it has been a great conversation. You are incredible. Thanks for listening to Ideas of India. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at s rajagopalan. In the next episode of Ideas of India I speak with Chandrabhan Prasad on the meaning of Ambedkarism Dalit capitalism and entrepreneurship